Hi, my name is Scott Coffin, and I'm a research scientist with the California State Water Resources Control Board. Today, I'll be talking about management of microplastics in ecosystems and drinking water in California. In 2018, the California legislature passed Senate Bill 1263, which, re which requires the State Water Resources Control Board to work with the Ocean Protection Council to initiate a statewide microplastics strategy by the year 2022. By 2026, we are required to develop a risk assessment framework, develop standardized methods for monitoring, establish baseline occurrence data, investigate the sources and pathways of microplastics into the marine environment, and go back to the legislature with rest and recommended source reduction strategies. California legislature also passed Senate Bill 1422 in 2018, which requires the State Water Board to first define microplastics by July 1st of 2020, and by July 1st of 2021, we are required to adopt a standardized method for monitoring, a plan for four years of testing and analysis in drinking water, consideration of adopting a health-based guidance level to aid consumers in interpreting concentrations of microplastics in their drinking water, and provide accreditation for laboratories. Defining microplastics is no trivial task, as this contaminant suite includes particles of different shapes, sizes, colors, and associated contaminants. The State Water Board adopted the world's first regulatory definition of, of microplastics for drinking water purposes on June 6th of 2020. This definition is broad and includes particles between 1 nanometer and 5,000 micrometers, with an additional size-based classification scheme shown here. This definition was based on a draft definition from the European Chemicals Agency, with a notable difference in that this definition provides no exclusion for biodegradable polymers, whereas the European definition does exclude biodegradable polymers. Senate Bill 1422 requires the consideration of adopting a health-based guidance level to aid consumers in interpreting drinking water concentrations. The health impacts of microplastics for both humans and animals are not fully understood. We address this knowledge gap by working with a number of researchers and experts to evaluate toxicity data and develop thresholds for drinking water and aquatic ecosystems through a collaborative project that started in 2020 and has just wrapped up. Our expert work group identified two main ways that microplastics can be toxic, including both chemical and particle-based hazards. Assessing risks of chemicals that are associated with plastic is quite challenging due to the complexity and diversity of mixtures. There's over 10,000 known additives of plastics worldwide. 2,400 of these are substances of concern, meaning that they're either persistent, bioaccumulative, toxic, or endocrine disrupting, or a combination of those characteristics. 53% of these substances are completely unregulated worldwide and 11% of these toxic substances have no scientific references. Despite this, there are some models available that are able to estimate the body burden generated from uh, plastic exposure. The focus of our work group was mostly on evaluating the particle-based hazards of microplastics. To assess the particle-based hazards for microplastics for mammals, we screened the literature for ingestion-based in vivo mammalian microplastics toxicity studies, in which we found 29, 29 available studies, and we screened each of these for different quality criteria relating to experimental design, particle character, characterization, and risk assessment applicability. When all 29 quality criteria were applied to these studies, no study actually fulfilled all of the criteria. So we actually had to take a slightly more lenient approach in the sake of pragmatism and restricted the criteria that these studies needed to meet to a subset. We were left with 12 fit for purpose studies that we then uh, elicited additional expert review for. Of the 12 studies deemed fit for purpose, the subject matter experts weighed in to assess the reliability of endpoints within each study. Here's an overview of the results we can see that studies heavily focused on reproductive endpoints, and they show consistent effects in male rodents across studies. To have a more clear understanding of potential health effects, we'd like to have more information on additional endpoints and organs. After evaluating the available evidence, our expert group concluded that significant data gaps prevent any reliable assessments of risks to humans at this point and suggested that the California State Water Board adopt a non-regulatory screening level, if any type of numerical value. 
Three major classes of problems prevented our expert group from recommending the development of a regulatory level for microplastics in drinking water. Largely, the effects database is inadequate, with most of the studies doing a poor job of characterizing the particles that they expose the rodents to, and they use a very limited subset of polymers, shapes, and sizes, with most of the studies using polystyrene spheres of a single size. This does not reflect the diversity of microplastics that humans are actually exposed to in drinking water and otherwise. Additionally, the effect mechanisms for microplastic mediated toxicity are unknown, and this is necessary to extrapolate the effects found in polystyrene spheres to polyethylene fragments of a different size or, or other types of varieties of microplastics. Lastly, we have a, a largely incomplete exposure database for microplastics exposure to humans with very limited information on food and no harmonized drinking water information. Our expert group developed health-based guidance level that may be used to aid consumers in interpreting any detection of microplastics in drinking water. The recommended language is as follows. Studies of rodents exposed to some types of microplastics through drinking water indicate potentially adverse effects, including on the reproductive system. However, more research is needed to understand potential human health implications and at what concentrations adverse effects may occur. Therefore, California is monitoring microplastics in drinking water and supporting ongoing research. There's currently an exponential growth in the number of laboratory studies of microplastics hazards in mammals. Our research effort identified data gaps and made recommendations for researchers to fill these data gaps in a high quality manner. Senate Bill 1263 requires the State Water Board and the Ocean Protection Council to develop a risk assessment framework for microplastics in the marine environment. Our expert working group evaluated evidence for impacts of microplastics to marine organisms in addition to the mammalian toxicity effects that I just showed. We identified four mechanisms that microplastics can be hazardous for marine organisms with entanglement, food dilution, internal lacerations, and cellular toxicity being mediated by different particle shapes and sizes. For instance, entanglement is more likely to occur with fibers and larger particles, whereas food dilution, uh, internal lacerations, and cellular toxicity are restricted to particles that are ingestible by the organism. In particular, cellular toxicity is, can only occur with particles that can actually translocate tissue, so very small particles. Ecotoxicological risk assessors often use species sensitivity distributions to estimate the concentrations that would be harmful for a community uh, in an ecosystem. We did this for microplastics, and you can see here on the most the most sensitive species for this figure is for Aresius melastigma or the marine madaka, with the, the least sensitive species being Hydra attenuata. Our expert work group recognized that multiple tiers of ecological harm should be derived that correspond to different management actions from protective to predictive. The rationale between this is that the lower tiers would be at concentrations that are relatively inexpensive for managers and potentially at reversible effects uh, for, for microplastics concentrations. With the higher tiers, we have more confidence in the outcome of, of the adverse effects, and they would be tied to more costly management actions and implications. For instance, when threshold one is exceeded, we would recommend increased monitoring frequency. Whereas when threshold four, the most stringent uh, threshold is exceeded, we may issue fish advisories or recommend some cleanup or something like this. We screened the aquatic microplastics toxicity literature and found 167 unique studies. We then screened these studies for quality criteria corresponding to experimental design, particle characterization, and risk assessment applicability. We were left with 21 fit for purpose studies that we then evaluated further through expert review. It should be noted that as in the mammalian uh, screening and prioritization, we also used a more lenient set of criteria here as if we had used all of the quality criteria, no studies would have passed through and uh, we would not have been able to do this assessment. Many of the laboratory studies used a single type of plastic of a single size, and in order to relate that to a 
diverse mixture of microplastics in the environment, we used what's called an ecologically relevant metric alignment approach described in Coleman's et al. 2017 and De Reuter et al. 2019. This posits that a metric associated with the particle corresponds to an observed adverse outcome. For instance, food dilution is predicted by the volume of the particle taking up space in the gut and is restricted in bioavailability by those particles that are ingestible. Whereas with tissue translocation mediated effects, the bioavailability is restricted to the translocatable sizes and the exposure metric is based on the surface area of the particle. We derived health-based protective levels for the four different thresholds that we identified. Reporting here in milligrams per liter for particles between 1 to 5,000 microns, we can see that food dilution mediated toxicities or, that are based on the volume of the particles are more sensitive than the tissue translocation mediated toxicities. We recognize that other organizations in the world may use different approaches for assessing risks using species sensitivity distributions, perhaps based on their own ecosystems and the species in those ecosystems or their own regulatory parameters. So we built an interactive R-Shiny application that allows users to quickly and easily build their own species sensitivity distributions for microplastics using the same data set that we did. This allows many different options shown here, including alignments and filters, and choosing the different ecologically relevant metrics. And once all of these parameters are set by the user, uh, it will filter and transform the database. And you can see in this interactive data table, the, the species that are included in the species sen sensitivity distribution. Uh, it then performs some uh, Monte Carlo modeling in order to derive a theoretical uh, statistical based species sensitivity distribution that can then be used to inform regulatory thresholds. This app is currently under development and will be released soon. If you'd like to stay tuned and follow updates, please follow at Tomex app on Twitter. California Senate Bill 1422 requires the State Water Board to adopt a standardized method for monitoring microplastics in drinking water. At the time of writing, there was no standardized or harmonized analytical methods for monitoring microplastics. To fill this gap, we worked with the Southern California Coastal Water Research Project to facilitate an inter-laboratory validation study for microplastics monitoring methods. The goals of this project were to determine the strengths and weaknesses of a suite of methods. To do this, laboratories measured known blind samples using standard protocols for several candidate methods. We quantified the accuracy and precision of each method and tracked the time and cost required to complete them. We also collected information regarding each laboratory's experience level and instrumentation. 26 laboratories from six different countries participated in the study, with good representation from academia, government, and industry. Five methods were assessed, including visual microscopy with and without Nile red dye, infrared spectroscopy, Raman spectroscopy, and pyrolysis with gas chromatography and mass spectrometry. Note that only two laboratories submitted data for pyrolysis GCMS, so we could not assess the precision and accuracy for that method. Laboratories were first sent blind samples that contained realistic mixtures of particles found in drinking water. Four common plastic polymers were used, each in varying amounts in four size fractions in four different shapes, ranging in sizes from 1 to 1,000 microns. Additionally, false positive materials like sand and shell fragments were added to test the robustness of the identification methods for parsing between plastics and non-plastics. Note that proficiency testing samples for microplastics are not commercially available at this time, so we had to work with an organization in Norway called NEVA to develop these samples specifically for this project. First, let's look at the overall findings from our study. On the y-axis here is the percentage of recovery, with a dotted line showing the 100% mark. The closer these uh, box plots are to the 100% mark, the more accurate the measurements. The grouping of the data reflects the precision of these, these measurements. Looking at the pane on the left for total particle recovery, we can see that there is relatively low recovery and low precision overall. But this is not the whole answer. 
looking at the second panel from the left in green, we can see the answer is different depending on the size classes. With higher precision and accuracy for particles 20 microns and larger, and relatively low precision and accuracy for the 1 to 20 micron fraction. In the third panel, we see higher recovery than expected for blue and clear particles, and lower than expected recovery for orange and white particles. A similar trend is seen, is seen with shapes on the final panel, with higher ex than expected recovery for fibers, likely due to background contamination of clothing, and lower recovery for fragments. We also see that experience matters for the accuracy and precision of results. On the left is the percent recovery for laboratories reporting the 20 to 212 micron fraction as a factor of the experience of those labs. Novice laboratories had higher than expected recovery, well above 100%, likely due to background contamination. Laboratories with less than one year of experience and expert laboratories with more than one year experience had lower recovery, closer to 100%, and this is likely due to the laboratories being more conservative with their, their estimates of, the, of what's actually plastic in their samples. We can see much better precision with the more experienced labs and no significant differences between the intermediate and the expert labs, suggesting that you need just about one year of experience in order to get reliable results. Standardized methods based on Raman and infrared spectroscopy are available on the Waterboard's website. Before posting these methods online, we received input from numerous outside experts from academia and government sectors in the United States and different countries. We invite written public comment on these methods until December 22nd. In addition to developing standardized methods for drinking water, our work group is also performing an interlaboratory validation study right now to validate methods for ocean water, fish tissue, and sediment. These standardized methodologies will be available early next year. Now that we have a definition for microplastics, standardized methodologies, a way to accredit laboratories, consideration of how to communicate those results to consumers, we can develop our four-year testing plan and analysis for microplastics and drinking water as required by Senate Bill 1422. In designing a monitoring campaign, it's important to understand where microplastics are likely to be found. First off, we know that microplastics are unlikely to occur in most groundwater wells. However, they are likely to be found in most surface waters. Additionally, treatment removes microplastics based on the filters and the particle sizes. Most drinking water treatment plants with surface water as their sources use filtration methods to remove particles anyway. Flocculation and sedimentation can remove particles down to the single micron size, and more advanced filtration methods such as microfiltration, ultrafiltration, ultra nanofiltration, and reverse osmosis can remove even smaller particles. As a reminder, our Raman and infrared methods can reliably quantify microplastics as small as 20 microns, so they are unlikely to detect the sizes of microplastics that will make it through most treatment techniques. However, we know that laboratories can quantify smaller particles using these Raman and infrared methods, with some laboratories reporting microplastics as small as 200 nanometers. Here's some real world data for drinking water treatment processes to remove actual microplastics. Uh, starting from raw water to the left, all the way to treated water on the right, you can see the different treatment processes. And we see a dramatic reduction in the total microplastics counts between raw water and sedimentation and filtration, with lower removals uh, using GAC uh, before being um, fully treated. And the particles that are left that make it through these filtration are smaller than 10 microns, with the majority of these particles in the one to five micron fraction. Microplastics, like other particles, have predictable behaviors in the environment. As microplastics get smaller, they become exponentially more abundant. This relationship, which is illustrated through this histogram based on real world data, may be likened to an iceberg. If one knows the shape of an iceberg, they may measure the visual portion and reliably estimate the portion that they can't see below the surface. For microplastics, we have a decent understanding of the size distributions of microplastics in freshwater to particles as small as one micron. 
In recognition of the limited laboratory capacities for monitoring microplastics, the high costs of monitoring, and the uncertainties with regards to health effects, the State Water Board is taking an iterative, targeted, exploratory monitoring approach to assess contamination in the state. This approach is similar to the United States Environmental Protection Agency's unregulated contaminant monitoring role. We propose a two-phase approach in which the first phase focuses on characterized contamination in major source waters for microplastics that can be reliably quantified using our Raman and infrared spectroscopic methods. The focus in phase one will be on characterizing contamination in source waters that are used as drinking water for the majority of the California population. Surface waters would be targeted due to the high likelihood of contamination. During phase one, several surrogate methods will be evaluated to determine if they can be used as a preliminary, cheap, easy screening technique to detect whether or not microplastics may be present. Uh, phase two will focus more on the treated particles, still looking in, sor in source waters, but using methods to look for particles that are actually making it through the treatment and all the way down to the distribution system. We will be using a tiered monitoring approach at this point if we have some validated surrogate methods from phase one. During both sampling phases in California, we will be using the ASTM D833220 sampling protocol. This technique is relatively simple and involves connecting a flow meter and flow control valve to a sampling tap, then filtering water through a stack of sieves. The collected particles can then be taken to a laboratory and analyzed using the standardized Raman and infrared methods. When concentrations of microplastics in drinking water are communicated to California consumers, we want to make sure that they understand the options for reducing their personal exposure. Right now, we do not recommend that consumers use bottled water if they believe that they have problems with their tap water uh, for microplastics. This is due to relatively high concentrations found in bottled water, uh, about two to three times higher than what's found in tap water on average. The reason that we're finding so many microplastics in bottled waters is the bottle themselves. When you open a plastic water bottle, there's a shearing mechanism that actually generates microplastic particles, exposing the consumer to anywhere between 14 and 2400 particles uh, based on two studies published in 2020. Senate Bill 1263 requires that we recommend source reduction strategies back to the legislature by 2026. I'm going to cover some of the general thinking that we have right now for solutions to the microplastics issue here in California. If we continue with business as usual, the world will see a doubling in the amount of plastic pollution that enters our marine environment by the year 2030 relative to today. Based on increasing concentrations of microplastics in the marine environments, we anticipate that widespread risks may be inevitable for microplastics in global oceans, with risks concentrated in certain areas such as the Yellow Sea and off of the Pacific coast of California. California is considering addressing the plastic problem from all appropriate problem frames. We know that the drivers are widespread, including socioeconomic, health impacts, and environmental impacts. Each of these influence the different problem framings, all the way from plastic as a waste issue to plastic as a system issue. And we intend to apply sets of solutions that apply to each of these problem frames. From the systems level, we're thinking of a circular economy, and at the waste level, we're thinking about cleanups and restricting the amount of waste that enters the environment in the first place. Cleaning up plastic once it has reached the open ocean is extremely challenging. The Ocean Cleanup Project intends to deploy 600 meter long floating barriers in the ocean's garbage patches to, quote, clean up the ocean within the next 20 years. Assuming these ocean cleanup devices work without failure, and that 100% of the collected plastic can be removed from the ocean, regardless of its size, Hone et al. 2020 estimate that only 0.09% of total ocean surface plastic would be removed by the year 2150. Moving further upstream, we know that bioretention cells are very effective for removing microplastics from urban stormwater before they can enter the marine environment. 
with a recent study finding that a bioretention cell removes 84% of microplastics and other anthropogenic microparticles entering the marine environment. A significant amount of plastic pollution is sent overseas from the United States and counted as landfill diversion or even recycling. California banned this practice this year with the passage of AB 881. We hope that the United States will follow suit. Additionally, the California Recycling and Plastic Pollution Reduction Act will appear on the November 2022 ballot for Californians to vote on. Among other things, this would include a one cent fee for the manufacturers of all plastic packaging with a goal of reducing plastic overall. AB 1276 was also recently passed in California, which reduces the serving of unnecessary food service wear. This bill expands the plastic straws upon request law to include other single use food items, other food facilities and third party delivery platforms, including food delivered, served on site or picked up. It would also require reusable food service wear for spe specified on site dining. Piecemeal legislation is not going to stem the tide of plastics. We urgently need a global binding specific treaty to address plastic pollution. The last time we had a legally binding international agreement to make impacts for the marine environment was the UN Fish Stocks Agreement in 1995. All of the subsequent agreements have been voluntary in nature and have had limited impact. Thank you all for your attention. I look forward to hearing your questions and comments and I encourage you to find me on Twitter and to reach out to me directly via email.